Hello, I'm Elise Nelson, President and CEO of Vital Voices Global Partnership. And I'm thrilled to be here and joined by ReEarth Initiative co-founder, Shia B B Bastida. Hate is not a virus. Um, I'm sorry, Hate is a Virus CEO, Tammy Cho, and Freedom March NYC co-founder, Chelsea Miller. Thank you guys so much for spending your International Women's Day with us. I think we're really at a unique moment where the impact of young and emerging leaders on our national conversations is more visible really than ever before. And even as the COVID-19 pandemic and economic downturn have really disproportionately impacted women, particularly women of color, what is so inspiring to me, and I'm sure to all of you, is just how women are rising up. And they're really leading us forward with creative solutions, really responding directly to the needs of their communities. Chelsea, I think of you and what you've done with Freedom, Freedom March NYC and how really you, know, you came to your leadership by the same way so many other women do, where you saw a problem in your community and you wanted to step up to write it. Can you talk a little bit about why this moment in particular is, is feeling different, um, particularly for the Black Lives Matter movement? Why have young people, particularly young women of color, been, been so critical for that change? Yes, absolutely. So when I think about the time that we were in when the death of George Floyd flooded in a lot of ways our phones, right? Because we were at home, we were in a pandemic and really trying to reckon with the reality, especially for Black folks in this country, that we were in the midst of two pandemics. We had to choose between COVID-19 or racism. We had to make the decision what we were going to step out there for and what we were going to combat. And so what it came down to was really making sure that as the narrative and the media was focused on the looting and the rioting, it was our responsibility when you talk about history history and the civil rights movement and the work of continuing to carry on the legacy and realizing that the civil rights movement never ended. It just has taken on so many different forms. It was our duty and responsibility to get out there and make sure we were doing the work. We were keeping us safe. We were understanding community, the importance of that, and we were changing the narrative. And so it has been an incredible journey to see from the first nights that we went out with gas masks on and there were police choppers in the air to then throughout the summer being able to see more people feeling comfortable exercising their First Amendment rights and going out to protest and so many young people on the front lines and Black women leading on the front lines. And so what I will say is that we are in an age where social media and technology has really enabled a lot of the mass sharing of information. Um, but also when we think about the fact that Black women have become more visible in this movement, Black women have always been a part of movements, from Ida B. Wells to Shirley Chisholm to Marsha P. Johnson. You can go on and on. We have carried movements, but the truth is we have a lot of times not received the credit. And so for us, it was really important to make sure that we were centering ourselves, our authenticity, our leadership in the midst of the movement for Black lives. Mm. Mm. You know, I think that uh, what I've certainly seen working with women leaders over the last 24 years across every country around the world is that women really do lead differently. And there is something about this moment that I think really calls for that kind of leadership that women bring. And Shia, I think about, um, about your leadership. You're such an example of bringing this new approach. Obviously the climate movement is not new, um, but I think that young people are bringing a new energy to it. How has this movement made so much progress really with the voices of young people? Well, I think that's a really interesting question because I think that the way in which we're organizing is the way in which we want the world to organize itself, if that makes sense. The types of leadership that we are uh, embedding in our organizations are the same types of leadership that we want to see in politics, in international NGOs. Um, and that's a type of leadership that is non-hierarchical when it comes to decision-making, a type of leadership that is collaborative decentralized, and that gives us the power to be global, the power to have hubs around the world. Um, and that has really helped the climate movement flourish. It's not something that is concentrated in one or two countries. It's something that has, you know, really um, dissipated. 
And that is because of how uh, our leadership is working. And I'm so excited to tell you that, you know, most of the leadership in the climate movement is young girls. Uh, in just my organization alone, 90% of the body is women. And that doesn't mean that we don't need everyone to be part of it. It just means that women are the ones who are taking that step forward um, because we have that nature of protection, protecting others. And we want to protect our communities and we want to protect our children. And we just want that to be for all of humanity. You know, that feeling um, of protectionism to be part of all of our organizations, part of all, all of our leaderships. Um, so I think that's uh, why it's worked so well. And also just choosing who your co-leaders are when you rise up in your city, when you rise up in your country, choosing who you're gonna co-lead with is super important because mm -hmm. it's not only about how you lead yourself, but um, how you make sure that the organization start, stays healthy and stays proactive. Mm. So Tammy, similarly um, to both Xie and Chelsea's stories, you saw a horrific problem of uh, violence against the um, AAPI communities across the United States and beyond. And as the CEO of Hate is a Virus, um, you are working to dismantle racism and intolerance. What have you seen um, in the past year to really better mobilize communities to take action against hate? And what are, what are some of your priorities of the organization going forward? I, I would love to also hear the story of how you founded the organization. Absolutely. You know, um, Hate is a Virus is a nonprofit community of mobilizers and amplifiers to dismantle racism and hate. Um, and we actually first got together um, to launch the movement last year, back in March 2020. And it was in response to the first spike in hate crimes um, that we were seeing uh, with, the, with the AAPI community. Um, and I was able to get together actually through my co founder, uh, Michelle Hanabusa. Uh, who uh, put out a social media post sharing that she um, felt really uh, frustrated, upset, and heartbroken seeing all the news um, and that was happening around these issues. And, um, you know, uh, it was right around the time I also felt <laughs> like I really had to do something about this, um, especially because these issues hit close to home with, um, you know, my parents were small business owners and uh, just seeing the level of racism that we've been experiencing uh, pre-pandemic and then to see continued attacks on the elderly and the most vulnerable populations didn't sit well with me. And so given the opportunity to reach out to Michelle, we ended up jumping on a phone call um, and talking about what, what is the first step that we could take really um, to help be a part of the solution. Um, and the first immediate step seemed to be to drive local awareness. And, you know, as Chelsea had touched on as well, we have social media, um, access to social media and these digital platforms. And so um, the very first step that we took was launching a campaign to really uh, uh, raise awareness of the type of incidents that were occurring. We used the hashtag hate is a virus. It started with just a few members um, of our community and they ended up spreading it to their friends and their family members and soon this was this became a viral movement um and it, since then we've also um really focused on you know as we were hearing more and more from our community in terms of what type of resources they needed uh, we then decided to take the next step of becoming a nonprofit organization and so with that, you know, our first, um, a few of the key program areas that we're focused on is one, continuing to drive local and national awareness of these issues. Um, second, it's really focused on the educational component because we recognize that awareness is just the first step. Um, we want to continue to create different resources for our community to better understand not just what is happening among our communities of color, but also why it's happening, including the important historical context as well. And then the final piece is um, really focused on providing funding for these local and national organizations as well and finding ways to uh, partner with them to really uplift and amplify the work that they're doing. Because something we also recognize is that, um, you know, 
racism is not new. These issues are not new. And there have been people who have been on the grounds doing the work for generations. And, and you know, as young people, we have opportunity to partner with them and learn from them and continue the work um, and build upon the work that they have set. Mm. You know, as all of you talk about the movements that you've led, I think what's the, the thing that connects each of your stories is that it, it is about power expanding when it's shared. And each of you talk about how you didn't do this alone. You have co-founders, you have, you have partners. Um, Chelsea, I wonder if, if you could think back to when, you know, a few years back when you were starting your work, um, what sort of support could you have really used in those early days that you really hope to give the next generation uh, with that idea that leadership is about, you know, using your power to empower? Yeah, that's a really good question. And that's the first time someone has ever asked me that. So I would say that what I think that I needed the most a few years ago, even before Freedom March NYC, was funding, was funding and thinking about the sustainable aspect of this work, um, especially I think for activists, right? There tends to be burnout. There tends to be this idea that you can carry all of this work by yourself um, in a lot of ways. And I think that over time, I've learned the importance of community, the importance of leaning in, the importance of understanding that though you are an activist and though you exist within the work of social impact, that there are so many other facets of yourself and you don't have to dim your light for anyone. You don't have to be boxed in for anyone. And so I think that for me, one of the biggest things was understanding kind of like pathways. Um, and so when I mean funding, I don't even necessarily mean in the sense of like organizational support. I think of it through the lens of kind of like big picture. What does it look like to do this work on such a massive scale? What does it look like to equip yourself with the resources that look like funding, that look like amplifying your message, that look like being able to be in the rooms or oftentimes create your own rooms that can ultimately contribute to the longevity of the work that you're doing? Because I see so many times nonprofit organizations that exist for one to two years and then no longer, right, because of the fact that this work is so difficult. And in addition to the work being difficult, there's also so many other personal um, struggles that people go with on a day to day basis on a day-to-day -day basis. And so for me, it's just so important to really make sure that with Freedom March NYC, we are reimagining what those pathways look like. We are investing in the youth. A lot of people say the youth are the future, but aren't giving resources to the youth to lead and show up in that way. And so that's a lot of our work. And I remember when we were first on the front lines, one of the things that we said was that we need amplification, we need funding, and we need to think about how to sustainably do this work because we know what's going to happen with the Black Lives Matter movement and everything that's happening during the summer because it happened in Ferguson and it happened during Trayvon Martin's case where it's trending for a few months, the world is paying attention, and then before you know it, there's another issue on a global scale and people forget and think that now we're back in a post-racial society and that's false. And so it really is on us that in those moments where the world world is asking us, what do we need? We say we need the funding and we need the pipelines to be able to do this work so that when the cameras turn off, we're still here showing up in the way that we need to. Mm -hmm. And I think that the way you've gone about it has been so powerful because you don't just say get out and march, you know, raise your voice. You've given young people really concrete steps and actions that they can take to make a difference. And I think that is a huge differentiator for why I think you've been able to mobilize so many young people. Mm -hmm. I love the earlier conversation between um, Alicia Keys and Amanda Gorman. And uh, Amanda, of course, was part of a program that you were part of uh, with Vital Voices, our Her Lead Fellowship for, for Young Women that really kind of invests in and takes a chance on people who other people haven't taken a chance on. But what I find is that those are the brilliant ideas because those are the ideas that have not been tried, right? And what we know is what we've tried thus far hasn't worked. So we need those new and innovative solutions. And what I love that Alicia um, was giving her such great advice about how to be fine with these sort of um, imperfections, right? And to not feel like just because you're now an icon, you don't have to be perfect. And I think these messages to young women are so deeply important. Shea, I wonder if you could talk more about your work and particularly how 
you've been really working to make the climate movement accessible to all people. And I think so many of us know that the climate movement, quite frankly, has in the past been dominated by a lot of men. Um, so how has that experience really shaped your perspective on inclusive and, and intersectional leadership? Well, I think that's one of the most important topics right now in the climate movement. The fact that the climate movement has been led for the past 60 years by you know, male white organizations, Greenpeace, Sierra Club, which have been awesome in their particular you know, um, scopes, but they haven't really extended to community, the health of communities, the health of people, health of generations, health of ecosystems, health of indigenous communities. What I want to see is a climate movement that is not only recognizing, not, not climate movement that not only recognizes um, how the climate crisis affects, you know, immigration, women, um, how it disproportionately affects some communities more than others, um, how environmental racism plays in, um, the generational injustice of the climate crisis. Um, I want a climate movement that recognizes all of this. And once we recognize that, uh, we are able to transfer that to holistic solutions. Because if we cannot see how the climate crisis is intersectional in how it creates the problems, we cannot create holistic solutions that actually are not only about how many parts per million of carbon we are in the, atmos are in the atmosphere, um, but how you are empowering communities to not only deal with the repercussions, of the climate crisis, but also how to deal with all of the infrastructure that is polluting their communities. Um, I'm talking about, you know, where does all of our trash go to? It goes to poor Southeast Asian communities um, in Southeast Asian countries. Where do where the pipelines go through? It goes through indigenous land all over the US and across the world. Um, so I think that that is one of the most important things to take away from how the climate movement is evolving. The fact that it has to be intersectional, it has to be um, geared towards, you know, everyone because I, and that's the purpose of making the climate movement inclusive. The fact that we need more voices, more diversity so that our solutions look diverse, so that our solutions work for everyone. So that the climate movement is not being gatekept by metal straws and, you know, um, kind of like this elitist way of looking at sustainability and who can afford sustainable things, because it's not about that. It's about people power. It's about people health and the health of our communities. Mm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And and certainly your work is is absolutely doing that. And I love the story, um, Zia, and I wonder if you could just share it of how you started to work on the issue of the climate crisis, because you were personally affected. Your community was personally affected. Can you just tell us that quick story? Because I'm such a big believer that you can only change what you know, and you knew it firsthand. And so you feel it very authentically and, and lead from that very authentic place. Yeah, of course. And thank you for you know opening the space to share stories, because I think stories are what change perspectives, you know, more than data, stories empower data in a way. Um, and so, yeah, I grew up in Mexico in a very small town, about 10,000 people uh, west from Mexico City. And my town historically, historically, I mean like 100, 200 years ago, was a fishing community. But Mexico City started taking water away from my town to a point where now we don't have the lake that we used to have. Um, and there, there was a lot of kind of shift from being dependent on water to being dependent on other things. So that was the first thing that happened, that the culture, the tradition of my community was stripped away. Um, then over the following years, while I was growing up, there was an entrance of factories, uh, transnational companies trying to build a train from uh, my community to Mexico City and connecting others uh, with complete disregard of our aquifer, our wetlands. And, you know, my dad, uh, he's part of the Otomi Toltec in indigenous community, which is um, in my town and in several others. So I grew up with that notion of reciprocity, of um, taking care of the earth because we are part of Mother Earth and not living from it. So living with the earth rather than from the earth. And knowing all of this, 
um, I saw how that relationship was being disrespected, how everything was actually being polluted, contaminated, extracted, and that people were profiting off of that pain. And that just makes no sense growing up from a perspective of loving everything around you. And in 2015, when I was 13 years old, my hometown suffered from flooding. So that's the moment where I realized not only that the climate crisis was already happening, but also that it was affecting communities with the least resources to deal with it the most. And mm -hmm. from that perspective, I decided that I couldn't wait to grow up to deal with the climate crisis. I had to give it my all, even as a young woman. Mm, love that, because you know you, you, you can't wait for an invitation to lead change. And I think that's what is so powerful about, about young women's leadership today. Tammy, I want to I want to turn to you. We heard earlier um, in the program from Dolores Huerta, uh, and she was in conversation with one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, uh, Patrice Calor. And she was they were talking about how today, and and Chelsea, you alluded to this earlier, how today all of these movements, a lot of these movements for for uh, racial justice, are actually being led um, by women. So why do you think it's important that? Um, communities of color collectively work um, to dismantle systemic racism. I mean, I'm thinking particularly about the work that you do um, with this latest spur of, of horrific hate crimes and violence against the AAPI community. How do you think young women also are really uniquely positioned to lead this collective movement? That's such a great question. You know, I think for for these movements, you are right, where I, a lot of them are um, led by incredible women. I think one thing to also know is that uh, the reality also is that even though uh, these issues, as we mentioned, have been going on for so long, and oftentimes in the past, the faces may have been men, but there were still women that were always there doing the work as well. And I, I'm so I'm so grateful that women are finally getting the recognition and the platform to be able to speak the truth and be able to share and lead these movements as well. Um, you know, something else that we had found, there, there had been a study uh, published recently by um, uh, Harvard Business Review as well, which talked about how women are actually uh, rated more positively, more effective in times of crisis than um, male leaders are. And um, across the different 19 core competencies that they evaluated, women rated higher on 13 of those. And those included um, areas like taking initiative, being able to inspire and motivate others, and also ability to learn and adapt quickly. Um, and I think that is what we're seeing in these moments in, in this time during the pandemic with the issues that are going on with all the hate and the racism. Um, we are seeing more women be able to step up and adapt in such a high pressure situation. And I think it's so important to your question earlier to continue to find ways to support, uplift and amplify these women even further. And as Chelsea mentioned as well, you get more funding um, to our young leaders as well. Uh, you know, even, even in regards to the funding conversation, um, where many of us are aware of the pay gap, um, and whether it's with female founders or a philanthropic venture funding, all of that is disproportionately low um, in terms of allocation to women despite this. And so we really need to shift that narrative and shift that dynamic and be able to provide more funding and support to our young leaders. Mm. Well, I want to ask you all one final question, although we could go on all afternoon. But, you know, when Vice President Harris was told that it was not her turn, not her time, I'm sure you've heard something similar or worse, um, she actually said, hey, I eat no for breakfast, uh, which I love. And I wondered if you could, each of you, and we'll start with Chelsea, give us sort of a message um, to inspire those who may have been told something similar that, you know, wait your in, wait for your invitation to lead. The perfect time will come. We all know the perfect time is not going to come. You know, you can't wait for the invitation. So Chelsea, what is, what is that sort of mantra in your head or those words of encouragement or inspiration that you'd give to, to those tuning in today and thinking, well, I want to do, I want to do something to make change in this world. Absolutely. And so this is something that I actually have lived by for the past couple of years when I've made decisions that I'm like, 
you know, there's there's a risk associated with this. And, and am I going to fail? But even in that, I still believe in the importance of betting on yourself. And so that's what I always say, bet on yourself. And so when you think about other people's dreams that you spend so much time trying to build or other people's dreams that you try to fit your path in because this is what's going to make them happy. Even in the midst of the doubt, bet on yourself and you will always surprise yourself because you learn about your leadership, you learn about your potential and you learn about what you're capable of. Mm. Tammy, what about you? I would say change starts with you. Um, I think oftentimes in these moments of crises, um, we understandably get paralyzed in some moments, um, or we oftentimes feel like we have to wait for that one leader or that one organization to kind of step up and be the leader, leader of change here, um, when in reality, each of us can take steps um, to be a part of the change. That could look like, and it really is different for each person, depending on their strength as well, right? So if, if your strength is being able to produce artwork that really helps illustrate your feelings, that could be one way that you contribute as part of the change. It could also be taking the time to do some of that internal work and internal self-reflection, um, reading about books about these issues and figuring out how can I check my own biases and, and be able to be a part of the change. And so really just want to encourage folks to recognize that they have incredible power in their own, own, own self and in their own hands and be able to use that to continue to push these different movements forward. Hmm. And she, what about you? I would say to be a stubborn optimist, and that is not always the most popular idea, but truly believe in your power of changing the world. We have agency every single day. If you wanna know what the future looks like, look at your actions today. And when you believe in yourself and believe in the future you're building, everything becomes about building joy. Everything becomes about what am I doing today to not only uh, make this work enjoyable and build community, but also make our future enjoyable and build community in the future. Mm. Well, thank you, um, Shia, Chelsea, and Tammy. I can't imagine a better way, a better last conversation uh, for this Voices of the Future Summit. So thank you to the three of you for your incredible work and for being here today at the Time Women's Summit.